we're happy to have uh, our, our grand round speaker uh, today, uh, Dr. Glenn Pollen, uh, who, as you can see, is the medical director of uh, the EP lab at Ochsner. Um, he, um, he did his residency, telemedicine residency from UPenn, um, and then uh, went on to do his cardiology fellowship from uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital, uh, Cornell. Um, then he came back to UPenn for uh, finishing up his uh, clinical EP fellowship. Uh, he was in private practice for a, a few months to a year and then um, uh, went on to uh, become the director of EP at uh, Oshner. Um He's going to talk to us today about the uh, novel anticoagulant agents and uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Pollan to give us the talk. Great. Thank you, Dr. Dominic, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Reddy, for uh, inviting me out uh, to speak today uh, about uh, uh, anticoagulation and atrial fibrillation. Uh, I'm going to uh, not be showing you too many Kaplan-Meier curves or, or statistics. I really want to uh, focus on the, on the practical aspects of, uh, of managing these, these patients. Uh, these are my disclosures. So the number of patients with AF in the U.S. is, is expected to increase. Uh, there are some estimates by the year 2050 there's going to be almost 16 million people in the U.S. with AFib. When, when I have a patient come to me in the office and they say, you know, why did I get AFib? Uh, there, there are a lot of risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, tobacco. The biggest risk factor is age. Until we find a fountain of youth, uh, there are always going to be people uh, coming to us uh, with a new diagnosis of AFib. About 5% of people over the age of 70 have AFib, 10% of people over the age of 80, 17% of people over the age of 85, and as far as I'm concerned, by the time people hit 90, they, they have AFib until proven otherwise. So this, this is a, a patient population we're only going to be seeing more of. No one has ever died of atrial fibrillation in and of itself. People can uh, present to you with a cardiomyopathy related to uncontrolled heart rate, a tachycardia-mediated cardiomyopathy. You get their heart rates under control or you restore sinus rhythm, uh, and that cardiomyopathy almost always resolves. So the AFib doesn't kill people, but the strokes kill people. Uh, everything else being equal, someone with AFib is about five times more likely to have a stroke than someone that doesn't have AFib. And not only do strokes uh, kill people, uh, but they obviously also result in uh, significant uh, uh, morbidity. So since the uh, 1950s, uh, the only option that uh, we've had uh, to treat our patients with AFib and prevent these strokes is, uh, is warfarin. Uh, it uh, inhibits uh, vitamin K dependent synthesis of factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Uh, and uh, in a meta-analysis of six trials, was shown uh, to reduce stroke risk by 62% and reduce all-cause mortality by 26% compared to placebo. So warfarin works, warfarin saves lives. Yet, it, if you look at this uh, uh, graph uh, on the x-axis, what you see are just a number of different studies published over the years looking at patients with AFib and a history of stroke or TIA. So, you know, these are our highest stroke risk AF patients. I mean, in general, what predicts something uh, from occurring in one of our patients? A, a history of that same event occurring in our patients in the past. Uh, and the biggest risk factor for strokes in our AFib patients is a personal history of stroke. So x-axis are just all these different studies. And the y-axis is the percent of patients in these studies that were actually anticoagulated. And you see that even in this high-risk population across all these studies, you know, we, we were uh, not anticoagulating these patients uh, the, the way we should have been. Uh, so we have a, a life-saving, um, you know, intervention, warfarin. Uh, yet uh, it's under, un, has traditionally been underutilized, and you know the question is why. Uh, and it, this sort of gets into some of the the problems with warfarin. For one thing, there's a delayed onset offset. Often in your higher risk patients, you're going to need to uh, bridge them with Lovenox. Uh, there's an unpredictable dose response. I might need. Uh, a milligram of, uh, of warfarin a day to keep my INR therapeutic. Someone else might need 10 milligrams. 
Uh, there's problematic monitoring. Uh, when a, a patient is started on Coumadin, they may need to go to Coumadin clinic a couple times a week until their INRs are therapeutic. Uh, and then they still need to travel there, uh, you know, every couple weeks, every month. And uh, it doesn't seem like much to us, but we, we all lead busy lives and don't have a lot of time for these sorts of things. And, you know, as patients get older, perhaps even driving to the Coumadin clinic, getting a ride there uh, can be uh, uh, an issue. Uh, there's the slow reversibility. There's the, the narrow therapeutic window, right? The, the sweet spot is between two and three. Uh, if your INR is running less than two, your risk of ischemic stroke goes up uh, markedly. If your INR is running greater than three, particularly greater than four, your risk of intracranial bleeding goes up. There are a uh, multitude of uh, drug interactions, and, and I, I mean, I can tell you, I've, I've never even tried to commit these to memory. I think you'd need to be a, a pharmacology PhD to, to keep all of these uh, straight in your head. But they're, they're all there, and they are true uh, 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 interactions that, uh, that uh, potentiate or you know, attenuate the effects of warfarin. Uh, and it's not just drugs, it's, it's foods, uh, green leafy vegetables, uh, prolonged hot weather, you know, the, a million different um, uh, factors that can uh, uh, increase or decrease uh, the INR. Uh, and then finally, there, there are the issues of bleeding. So, you know, one of the ways that we uh, assess a, a patient's risk of having a stroke when they come to us with AFib is we calculate a CHAD score. And, and more recently, the literature says we should be calculating a CHADS VASC score. And it's basically just a risk factor calculator, and you can Google Chad's VASC calculator and uh, do this online with your patients, and it'll spit out a percent risk of stroke per year. Uh, but if you look at the has bled risk score, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, overlap, hypertension overlaps between increasing risk of stroke and increasing risk of bleeding. Um, uh, stroke history uh, overlaps, age overlaps. Uh, and um, th this was actually a retrospective study looking at uh, a number of patients uh, who, were, uh, who carried the diagnosis of AFib. Some were anticoagulated, others were not. And uh, what you see is the, looking at the CHAD score, remember the CHAD score predicts stroke risk. In this uh, retrospective study, it also uh, predicted bleeding risk. So those patients intuitively that we feel are going to gain most from anticoagulation, those with the highest CHAD score, uh, are also the ones that we intuitively worry the most about uh, from the bleeding standpoint. So what would an ideal anticoagulant look like? Well, for one thing, uh, once daily dosing, uh, rapid onset and offset of action, minimal food and drug interactions, extra renal clearance, uh, and uh, an antidote. So over the, the past several years, uh, a new class of anticoagulants has come out to treat patients with AFib. We broadly refer to this class as uh, NOACs, or new oral anticoagulants. Uh, the first uh, uh, one to be approved in the U.S. was uh, Dabigatran, or Pradaxa, uh, largely on the results of the RELY study. Uh, about a year later, um, a factor 10A inhibitor, uh, Rivaroxaban or Xarelto was approved uh, based on the Rocket AF study, and most recently, Apixaban or Eliquis, also a factor 10A inhibitor, uh, was approved based largely uh, on the results of the Aristotle study. Uh, like I just mentioned, these, uh, unlike warfarin, which uh, uh, acts in, in multiple areas of the coagulation cascade, uh, Dabigatrin or Pradaxa acts. Uh, uh, on, uh, uh, as a direct thrombin inhibitor, preventing fibrinogen uh, from uh, forming fibrin, uh, while uh, rivaroxaban and apixaban are factor 10A inhibitors, work a little upstream in the coagulation cascade. So, you know, I think the first question to ask is, well, how do the new kids on the block stack up against, uh, against the old guard? Uh, how do the NOACs stack up compared to warfarin? So, you know, again, not to go into the details of, of these three important studies, uh, I, I will just tell you in general terms that as a class, uh, the NOACs outperform uh, warfarin with regard to stroke reduction 
uh, and bleeding reduction. Uh, there have been a number of meta-analyses published over the past several years. This is just one I, I happened to find uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, the NOACs as a class and comparing them to warfarin. You see uh, uh, on the left, uh, favor NOAC therapy. On the right, uh, favor warfarin therapy. And you see with regard to strokes, with um, with regard to strokes, uh, there's a, a, a significant reduction uh, in the NOACs as a class compared to warfarin. And, and interestingly, if you look at what types of strokes are really prevented, you know, ischemic strokes, there's, there's a trend toward um, a reduction in those. But it's, it's really hemorrhagic strokes that these NOACs shine. Uh, and, you know, I think the reason is, and it just gets back to the fact that, um, you know, maybe 30, 40 percent of our patients on warfarin are either under uh, anticoagulated or over anticoagulated. And my, my guess is uh, most of them are probably over anticoagulated, uh, the, the ones that are out of range. And I, I've never seen any data showing which patients from these three uh, major NOAC trials had hemorrhagic strokes, but uh, my, my guess is that they probably had super therapeutic INRs. Prodaxa, Xarelto, Eliquis, you know, speaking uh, in them in their brand name terms, you know, have much more predictable pharmacokinetics. Uh, major bleeds, uh, a trend toward reduction with the NOACs. And, and again, what kind of bleeds are we preventing? Uh, we're preventing intracranial bleeds. Uh, again, I think because of the, uh, the unpredictable uh, pharmacokinetics of, of warfarin compared to these newer agents. So in, in conclusion here, the, the NOACs reduce uh, clinical events, strokes, and bleeding, uh, and offer, also offer the possibility of, um, of uh, increasing the use of um, anticoagulants in, in RAF patients. Uh, they're not only superior, but uh, they, you don't need to monitor these patients uh, with, with regular blood testing, uh, and there's also minimal food and drug interactions. Now, are they perfect? They're, they're, they're not perfect. Uh, I, I think the, the biggest uh, uh, issue that comes up is uh, the fact that there's no antidote. Uh, and, you know, I have patients of mine that say, well, gosh, you know, what happens if I get into a car accident? At least on Coumadin, you can give me FFP or vitamin K or, or something like that. Uh, you know, do, do we have any options with the NOx? We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Let's just move on to some practical matters of uh, starting these new oral uh, anticoagulants. So, you know, I think one important thing, just, just like anyone you start an anticoagulant on, is you want to have a conversation with them about uh, the risks and the benefits. The risk here of starting a NOAC is the risk of bleeding, of course. Uh, it's a blood thinner. People tend to bleed on blood thinners. That's the number one, you know, side effect, complication, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that comes up. But on the other hand, uh, you're reducing risk of stroke. And everything else being equal, we know that um, the uh, benefits of stroke reduction uh, uh, outweigh any risks that, uh, uh, of bleeding. Another very, very important thing uh, to mention to these patients is that, um, you know, nuisance bleeding will occur. I mean, virtually every patient of mine uh, on one of these NOACs, or on Coumadin for that matter, who's over the age of, you know, 60, 70, they'll come in and say, you know, what do you think of this black and blue mark on my arm? What do you, you know, what do you think of this little bruise? I, I bumped into my coffee table and now I have, uh, uh, you know, a purple mark on my thigh. You, you need to reassure them that, that this is not uncommon. The anticoagulant is working. These are not life-threatening. Uh, and just, you know, carry on with, with your life. Uh, another Im Im very, very uh, important um, thing to mention to your patients is that, you know, this medication is only going to work if the patient takes it. So with warfarin, we know if our patients are, are compliant because their INRs are going to be running in the two, the two plus range. Uh, if a patient is non-compliant with uh, a NOAC, we, we don't know. We can only uh, trust the, the patient and what they're telling us. But I would certainly emphasize to them that if you're not taking it, uh, it doesn't work. Uh, and 
It does have a very uh, short, they do as a class have very short half-lives uh, in the range of 12 hours or so. So very quickly, unlike warfarin, if you stop taking the medication, your risk of stroke uh, returns to uh, you know, its baseline, its AFib baseline, as if you weren't on an anticoagulant at all. What other things do I do when, when I start a, um, a NOAC? I'll check a baseline creatinine. The, these are all, to some extent or other, renally cleared. Uh, and it's important to, to you know, know whether you need to down titrate the dose of the NOAC. I'll also get a baseline CBC. The, the more I, I prescribe these medications to my patients, the more I think of them as, as a bleeding stress test. Uh, I've diagnosed uh, uh, kidney cancer. Uh, after starting a patient on a NOAC because they came to me a couple weeks later. Yeah, you know, I'm just having a, a little bit of a red tinge in my urine. I sent the patient to a urologist uh, and lo and behold, they had kidney cancer, which thankfully was, was caught at, uh, at an early stage and was, was uh, uh, resected and, and cured. My, my point being that, that if a patient has a reason to bleed, uh, they, they're going to uh, bleed on one of these medications. But, you know, again, the elderly population, they may not uh, know that they're bleeding. They may not tell, be able to tell if, they're, if their stool is turned uh, black or something like that. So I'll generally get a CBC at baseline, and then when they come back four weeks later, I'll get another CBC and just make sure that the, that the hemoglobin is not uh, drifting down. Uh, ensuring compliance with NOACs. We, we've already uh, discussed uh, some of these issues. Uh, and, um, you know, I think as, as, a, as a, a field, you know, we just need to develop the, the best ways we can to optimize compliance, you know, with, with all the medications we prescribe, but, but certainly with, with these uh, uh, life-saving medications. Uh, and, um, yeah, I mean, just uh, again, number four, uh, if you suspect that you're dealing with someone who may not be compliant with their uh, NOAC medication, just put them on warfarin if you have any question. Uh, how do you switch uh, from one anticoagulant uh, to another? And, you know, again, this, this comes up more and more as, um, uh, as uh, insurance is becoming more generous in, in their coverage of these NOAC medications. Well, going from uh, one NOAC to another NOAC, you know, let's say you're going from Pradaxa to Eliquis, it's very easy. You basically have the patient take their last dose of NOAC A, and then they pick up where they left off with the dose of NOAC B. If you're switching from uh, warfarin to a NOAC, you stop the warfarin, you let the INR drift below two, and then you initiate uh, the NOAC. Uh, lastly, if a patient uh, needs to switch from a NOAC to a vitamin K antagonist, there, there are several ways to do this. Uh, the, the easiest way may just be to stop the NOAC and start uh, Lovenox uh, and Warfarin and uh, bridge with the Lovenox and discontinue when the INR is, uh, is above two. Uh, this is at least what the package inserts of these um, uh, no acts tell you to do. Uh, I think equally reasonable would just be to continue the patient on the NOAC, start warfarin when the INR is above two, stop the NOAC. Uh, on to management of, of bleeding. Well, with warfarin, we, we know how to manage these uh, bleeds that patients come into the ED with. We give them FFP, we give them vitamin K. Uh, and uh, rather rapidly, if they're bleeding, they're not bleeding because they're on an anticoagulant, they're, they're bleeding because of their, their primary bleeding issue. Uh, in the year 2014, there, there are no antidotes to the NOAC medications. Uh, there, there is a, a medication that's, um, that's currently in testing called Endexanet. It's a recombinant uh, modified factor 10A molecule that, that's basically an a anti-factor 10A inhibitor. So it would uh, reverse uh, Xarelto, reverse Eliquis. But it's, it's not available uh, at this time. So I think, you know, in, in thinking about this question, when we're dealing with a patient on a NOAC who's bleeding, our uh, best weapon is time. Within 12 hours, I mean, that's one half-life. Within 24 hours, that's, that's two half-lives. And if you can stabilize the patient with, um, 
with uh, PAC cells, with uh, FFP, again, not as a reversal agent so much as a plasma expander, uh, platelets, uh, and support, uh, and compression, and whatever else you have to do. You know, after 24 hours, uh, if that patient is bleeding, it's because of their primary bleed uh, and not because they're on an anticoagulant. Uh, patients undergoing uh, an elective uh, surgery. Um, th and this comes up a lot. In about 25% of our patients on anticoagulants, within two years, they're going to need some surgery or other uh, that's going to require at least temporary uh, discontinuation. Now, the um, Mayo Clinic website has a list of uh, surgeries that, that really have no bleeding risk versus minor bleeding risk versus major bleeding risk. Uh, I'm, I'm a, I like to think about things in a very simple fashion. And in general, if someone is going for a colonoscopy, uh, if I'm taking someone for an afib ablation, uh, if someone is going for a Whipple, just about anything, uh, outside of um, ocular surgery where there's really no vasculature that, that you can get into and therefore no bleeding risk. But, but pretty much everything else, I'll just have the patient stop it for 48 hours. You know, if you think about even a high CHADS VASC risk score in an AFib patient, let's say someone's, you know, CHADS VASC is, you know, five or something. They have a 12% risk of stroke per year. If you think, what does a 12% risk of stroke per year translate into per month? That's 1%. Per week, that patient has a 0.25% risk of stroke. So per day, that patient has a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of 1% risk of having a stroke. So do I feel uh, comfortable stopping uh, uh, a NOAC for 48 hours before a surgery uh, or a procedure? I, I, I do, and, and thus far, luckily, I've, I've had no issues with it. Uh, this is just that list that you can find on the Mayo Clinic website that actually goes into the classification of no risk bleeding, low risk bleeding, and high risk bleeding sorts of uh, uh, procedures. This also comes up a lot. When to restart anticoagulation following surgery. Uh, and um, I, I'll generally wait for 48 to 72 hours. Uh, and uh, if the patient is at high risk of events, I'll put them on heparin in the interim. Uh, why is that? It's because you know heparin we can easily reverse with protamine. Uh, and if that patient has some sort of bleed related to the surgery that they went through, uh, we, can, we can address that in, in a very timely fashion. Um, uh, after uh, 48 to 72 hours, uh, I think with the green light of the uh, operator, the surgeon, uh, I think it's okay to, to restart a, a NOAC. What I do for my AF ablations is I'll um, uh, I'll basically just start full dose heparin following the AFib ablation, check a CBC the following morning, check an echo the following morning. If everything uh, looks, like, looks good, hemoglobin stable, no evidence of an effusion, I'll restart the, the NOAC the next day. Uh, patients undergoing emergency surgery. Uh, you know, again, this is, this is one of these nightmare scenarios where Someone is on a NOAC, they just took their dose, and they, they get in a car crash, and they need to go for uh, some sort of emergency uh, uh, life-saving intervention. Uh, I, I think the best thing you can do is try to stabilize them for a minimum of 12 hours, which should take care of one half-life, and ideally 24 hours before the surgeon takes them. Um, you know, there, there are some, some boutique uh, um, blood products, prothrombin complex concentrate, uh, and, and such that, that you know, can be used in this sort of situation. But there's really very little data to, to inform us on this topic. So we, we've gone through some of the common scenarios that might come up with these medications. Uh, now on to the, uh, the unanswered question. So you know, I think we've, we've uh, establish that the NOACs are uh, overall uh, uh, safer and uh, in some cases more effective than, than warfarin, uh, but how about uh, how they stack up against each other? How does Pradax compare to Xarelto? How does Xarelto compare to Eliquis? You know, look, this is, this is big pharma. It would be uh, suicidal for them to, uh, you know, get in the ring and slug it out with a major clinical trial. 
uh, they, they'd be losing billions of dollars. And until these are generic some, sometime down the road, we're never going to see a head-to-head -head trial looking at uh, Pradaxa versus Xarelto, et cetera. But I, I think the more important question than that is, are there some certain clinical scenarios that might warrant the use of one anticoagulant over another? Uh, and we're going to uh, get into some of those here. And we're going to start by, by discussing patients with uh, mechanical heart valves. Uh, so this is a patient, JM. Uh, he's a 65-year-old guy with hypertension, coronary artery disease, uh, and uh, severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, he underwent uh, a three-vessel cabbage and a mechanical uh, mitral valve. Uh, his post-op course was notable, notable for paroxysms of AF. Uh, it was asymptomat asymptomatic. He was rate controlled. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, understandably, we said, well, let's just discharge him. Maybe this is all just post-op AFib and he's not going to have this uh, down the road. But sure enough, on, on event monitor several months later, we were still seeing these paroxysms of AFib. So the question becomes, what's the most appropriate anticoagulant to use in this patient? Th this gets into the definition of, of non-valvular atrial fibrillation. All three NOAC trials uh, looked at patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. That has a very specific definition. Non-valvular atrial fibrillation refers to atrial fibrillation uh, in patients who don't have prosthetic heart valves and in patients who don't have uh, moderate or severe mitral stenosis. With moderate or severe mitral stenosis, um, you know, the issue is that everything else being equal, uh, be because of the added uh, stasis, uh, you know, sta left atrial uh, uh, blood stasis associated with mitral stenosis, these patients, if they have AFib, are 10 to 15 times more likely to have a stroke than an AFib patient with the same risk factors without mitral stenosis. We don't see much mitral stenosis in, in the U.S. anymore, uh, but, but be that as it may, so mitral stenosis and AFib, that's valvular AFib. Prosthetic heart valves and AFib is valvular AFib. Uh, everything else is non-valvular AFib. So is there any data to support the NOACs uh, 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 for use in this patient? And, and there was a study called the, the Realign study. This was published in, in uh, September 2013 in the New England Journal. And it took patients uh, that had undergone aortic or mitral valve replacement, uh, and it um, randomized them to either dabigastran, pradaxa, uh, or to warfarin. And they were looking at bleeding endpoints, and they were looking at um, uh, stroke uh, endpoints. And the long and the short is that the, the trial was terminated uh, prematurely, uh, mostly because of um, risk of stroke. Uh, ischemic strokes uh, occurred in nine patients, 5% of the pradaxa group. Uh, no patients in the warfarin group. So these patients' valves were, were thrombosing uh, on Pradaxa. There, there were issues uh, related to bleeding as well, but I, I think you could realistically get around that if you just waited you know, a longer period of time before starting the Pradaxa. If, if it had not been designed at a, you know, start the Pradaxa at seven days or start the Pradaxa at three months, but just start the Pradaxa at three months. I don't know if we would have seen these bleeds, but, but be that as it may, the, the concerning part for me, and I think for, for most people, are, are the strokes. And the, these are the, the Kaplan-Meier curves. Again, you know, the first bleeding event, they tended to occur quite early. Uh, so you might be able to get around that starting Pradaxa later. But, uh, you know, the, the strokes just, they occurred early and they continued to occur uh, out to uh, 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 a year. And um, the conclusion of this study was that uh, the use of dabigatran has no positive value and was associated with excess risk in patients with mechanical heart valves. And you might ask, well, gosh, why does Coumadin work and why does Pradaxin not work in this patient population? I'm not a hematologist, but the way I wrap my head around this is that the way the coagulation cascade works, it, it works in a very different way uh, on a biological surface compared to on an artificial surface. A mechanical heart valve is an artificial surface. And um, you know, for whatever uh, uh, reason, a, uh, a direct thrombin inhibitor isn't good enough. 
Now, uh, Xarelto, Eloquis have not been studied uh, in this population, but, but after these findings, I, I think that uh, uh, those medications are never going to be studied in this patient population. I think that this, that this conversation has, has been put to rest and um, you know, someone with a mechanical valve uh, should be on, um, on warfarin. So this is a, a little wrinkle on the first case. This is a 65-year-old hypertension, history of TIAs, uh, and he has severe asymptomatic mitral regurge. Uh, and he was also just diagnosed with persistent AF. So CT surgery evaluates the patient and says, you're a poor surgical candidate. Uh, he, uh, uh, th there's an attempt at cardioversion, which is unsuccessful. And um, eventually the decision is made just to uh, treat this patient with a rate control strategy and just accept the fact that he's uh, going to be an AFib. And that's fine. But what is the most appropriate anticoagulant for this patient? So, you know, remember our definition of non-valvular AFib. This patient has severe MR. So severe MR is not mitral stenosis, right? Severe MR is not a prosthetic heart valve. So, uh, you know, I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive. You might say, gosh, severe MR, that sounds like valvular AFib. It's technically non-valvular AFib and technically someone with severe MR, someone with severe aortic stenosis, uh, et cetera, can be placed on one of the uh, new oral anticoagulants. And I would argue that uh, this patient should be put on uh, one of the NOAC medications. Patients with uh, impaired renal function. 55-year-old woman with uh, hypertension, diabetes, diastolic heart failure, and uh, CKD with a uh, creatinine of 2.1, uh, who comes into the hospital with pneumonia. And while they're uh, hooked up to telemetry, uh, we see that this patient's having uh, frequent paroxysms of symptomatic AF. So this patient is started on Sotolol. Uh, we've adopted a rhythm control strategy. But again, the question becomes uh, which anticoagulant to use. So, you know, AF and chronic kidney disease is, is, uh, is a tough one. Right, because CKD constitutes a risk factor for both strokes in AF patients and bleeding in AF patients. Uh, so, you know, this is a particularly high risk population uh, for, you know, both sorts of adverse events we, we see in our AF patients. Um, you know, none of the uh, trials uh, looking, at, you know, looking at the NOACs for stroke prophylaxis and AFib looked at patients uh, with creatinine clearances lower than 25. Uh, and you know, there's, there's certainly no data to inform us on their use in dialysis patients. If you look at the way that they're excreted, well, warfarin is uh, not excreted at all by the kidney. So warfarin obviously would be a safe option in someone with renal insufficiency. Pradaxa is the converse. Uh, dabigatran is 80% renally excreted. Uh, and there's some down titrations that, that I have not committed to memory that, uh, that should be uh, utilized if you're going to start this medication in an um, in, uh, in AF patient with a, a renal insufficiency. Uh, Rivaroxaban, Xarelto, is about two-thirds renally excreted. Uh, it also has a down titration associated with it based on creatinine clearance. Uh, Apixaban, Eliquis, 25% renally excreted. There, there's not a specific uh, down titration uh, for apixaban uh, in this population. Uh, what what uh, the, the FDA uh, uh, has, has asked us to do and, and the manufacturers is you calculate the, the, an ABC, age greater than 80, body weight less than 60 kilograms, creatinine greater than 1.5. If they have two of those three ABCs, you down titrate the apixaban dose from 5 BID to 2.5 BID. What that means is if you're dealing with um, uh, someone with a creatinine of 3 who is 100 kilograms and 60 years old, they only have one of the three ABCs, uh, and that patient should be on uh, 5 BID of Eliquis, the full dose. Uh, and actually, uh, because it's um, only 25% renally excreted, the, the FDA more recently approved Eliquis in the dialysis population. Uh, again, I, I, you know, there, there's no data to inform us on this. This is strictly based on its pharmacokinetics. But, um, you know, it, it is an, 
you know, a, a pixaban is the one alternative that you have to warfarin uh, in the dialysis population. Should I get that? Um, so, you know, back, back to our case. So calculating this patient's creatinine clearance, uh, it's 27 mils per minute. Um, so that would uh, result in pr uh, dabigatran being uh, down titrated, rivaroxaban being down titrated, uh, apixaban, uh, no need for that down titration. So, you know, conclusions here, use the, the NOx with caution in patients with moderate to severe severely impaired renal function. Uh, based on renal excretion and the bulk of data, uh, I would say that, that dabigatran is probably less safe than rivaroxaban or apixaban in this patient population. A and of course, you know, if, if you have someone with renal insufficiency that you're starting on a NOAC, you need to just monitor their, their creatinine every once in a while and just, you know, sometimes something more than once a year. Because as, as you know, these, these creatinines can, can go up uh, and um, you know, that, that could result in, in excess bleeding risk if it's not uh, uh, seen in, you know, if not real time, something approximating uh, real time. And undoubtedly, there'll be some randomized control trials comparing the NOAX to warfarin uh, in these patients down the road. Okay, let's move on to uh, MR. So MR is a, a 58-year-old with uh, a multitude of uh, cardiac risk factors uh, who was recently diagnosed with uh, symptomatic atrial fibrillation. So is, you know, are there any uh, considerations we could think about here? You know, I think probably a lot of you uh, uh, have heard over the past year or two that um, uh, there, there is just, um, uh, you know, j just an uptick in uh, MIs uh, in uh, patients on Pradaxa uh, uh, that have been uh, parts of the, um, the Pradaxa clinical trials looking at AF patients, looking at DVT PE patients. This is a, um, uh, a meta-analysis of, uh, of all of those trials showing that, um, uh, uh, that dabigatran uh, is uh, associated with uh, an excess risk of MI. Uh, interestingly, if you remove any one of these uh, studies, from uh, this, um, uh, 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 you know, collective uh, data cohort, it, it doesn't change the statistically significant excess in MI that's associated with Pradaxa. You know, five years ago, less than that maybe, a, a couple years ago, you know, th this was really uh, the only option outside, uh, besides warfarin that we could choose. So I didn't think about this issue too much back then because I still thought that, that the, the bulk of data supported uh, uh, the use, uh, and, and of course, ease of administration, ease for the patients, supported its use over warfarin. But now there, there are two other new oral anticoagulants where we haven't seen this uptake in MIs. So, uh, you know, would I, would I necessarily take someone off uh, Pradaxa if they uh, came in on it? Probably not. But if that patient looked like our patient who had, a, you know, a, a slew of cardiovascular risk factors, I may consider uh, changing them to, uh, to Xarelto or to Eliquis, one of the uh, factor 10As. Uh, so, you know, in conclusion here, uh, like I just said, consider rivaroxaban or apixaban in lieu of uh, Pradaxa in patients with significant cardiovascular risk factors uh, or a history of CADMI. Uh, lastly, cardioversion. So 35-year-old obese guy, uh, no significant past medical history. He comes in for his executive physical, uh, and they say, hey, lo and behold, you're, you're uh, in uh, AF. He admits to a little bit of fatigue over the past couple months, and, uh, and the thought is, well, you know, he's 35. He has some new fatigue. He'll probably do better in sinus rhythm. Uh, and uh, his cardiologist recommends as much, but he says, I don't, you know, I, I like sinus rhythm, I like the idea of that, but I don't want anyone to, to drop a TE probe down, down my throat. The thought of that scares me. So, you know, what, what options do we have uh, for this patient? Well, you know, going back to the, the AF uh, guidelines, you know, for a long time, uh, the recommendation for uh, cardioversion in AF is, if the patient's been in AF for less than 48 hours, you can cardiovert him without a TEE. 
uh, if they've been in AF for more than 48 hours or if they've been in AF for an indeterminate am amount of time, you need to do one of two things. You either need to treat them for a minimum of three weeks with warfarin at a therapeutic INR, and then you can cardiovert them without looking, uh, or you can take a look with a TEE, and provided they have no clots, uh, and again, provided that they're on uh, you know, therapeutic warfarin or on Lovenox or uh, heparin, uh, you can cardiovert them, and then you need to continue anticoagulation for a minimum of four weeks following. So all three NOACs uh, have now reported on outcomes following cardioversion. Uh, and um, in all three cases, uh, you know, only a minority of patients enrolled in RELY, Rocket AF, uh, Aristotle, uh, had a cardioversion. The largest experience was, you know, close to 2,000 patients uh, in the RELY trial. And, you know, keep in mind, these were, these were double-blind trials. So the person pressing the, the uh, uh, button on the uh, defibrillator, they didn't know if the patient was on Coumadin, if the patient was on um, uh, Eliquis or Xarelto. Uh, but nevertheless, the 30-day the incidence of strokes was less than 1% uh, in patients who, who were cardioverted on these new agents, and really no difference between the NOACs and warfarin. So that, that actually led to an update in the uh, 2014 uh, ACC AHA AFib guidelines uh, as a class 2A uh, for patients with AF or a flutter of 48 hours duration or longer, or when the duration is unknown anticoagulation with uh, dabigatran, rivaroxaban, or apixaban is reasonable for at least three weeks prior to and four weeks after cardioversion. Basically saying if, if you have a patient uh, uh, and they've been uh, compliant with their NOAC and you document that for three weeks prior, they don't need a TEE before uh, uh, you can go ahead with cardioversion. So uh, just conclusions here. Uh, the, the only one I really want to uh, emphasize, again, uh, compliance. If a patient's on warfarin, we know if they're compliant because we can follow their INRs. Uh, we need to rely on the, the patient's history to let us know if they've been compliant with a NOAC. Uh, and, you know, the stakes are high when you're cardioverting someone. Uh, we, we don't want to do any harm. We certainly don't want to uh, cause a stroke. So um, if there's any question about compliance with uh, NOAC, uh, if you can't reliably confirm that they've been compliant, uh, you probably shouldn't cardiovert and you should um, uh, perhaps consider switching them to warfarin. And for all my cardioversions on patients who are on NOACs, I do, in, in my H&P before the, the cardioversion, I do document that we had a conversation and that they have uh, stated that they are compliant, that they have been compliant with their medication. Uh, so that's, uh, that's all I got for you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes? How about the safety of NOACs with the uh, ACT, with the mint or affiant of the addicts? Yeah, you, you know, I, I mean, look, everything else being equal, if, if one is on antiplatelet agents in addition to an anticoagulant, uh, their, their bleeding risk is, is going to go up. I, I think for, um, you know, in some cases, you can get around this by putting in a bare metal stent. But, you know, that, that's, that's because then you're only, uh, um, you know, you only require really, what, 30 days of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. But that, that's not always optimal. I mean, you know, someone is doing a left main intervention, or maybe not a left main, but some you know, proximal LAD intervention. I'm not an interventionalist, but, but clearly there are cases where uh, a drug-eluting stent uh, is, is much preferable to uh, a bare metal stent. I, I think at least for the elective cases, semi-elective cases, uh, the best thing you could do is to have a, a conversation with the electrophysiologist about it. Um, look, the, the bleeding risk is going to go up, but I, I still think that for the majority of patients, uh, the interventionalist should put in what they need to put in. If you have, um, you know, someone who's, who's very old, you, you very much worry about bleeding, perhaps consider a bare metal stent. You know, conversely, if, um, if you have someone who you're, you're very worried about bleeding, but they have a low chads vask score so that their risk of stroke per year is, um, you know, in the range of 1%, 2%, 
You know, again, I, I think as long as you, you are thoughtful about it and you document your decision making, you might say, okay, well, we're just going to go with dual antiplatelet therapy for a year and hold off on anticoagulation. Uh, I, I, I don't think that there is a, a blanket recommendation I, I would make on this subject. It's really just a matter of, um, you know, collaboration between the, the interventionalists, uh, collaboration and communication between the interventionalists and the EPs, uh, you know, weighing the, the risks and benefits of the, the different options available. Yes? How about using NOEX in elderly patients? Which one of them is safer and you prefer over the others? You know, when, when, I, when I worry about elderly patients, I, I generally worry about, um, you know, how steady or unsteady they are uh, on their feet and, and what are the, the risks that they're going to, to hurt themselves. I, I don't know whether I would necessarily recommend one over another uh, based on that reason uh, alone uh, in, in terms of one, one NOAC uh, or other. What I would say, though, is, you know, again, it, it just boils down to a risk-benefit. And, um, you know, one, one not, not to evade the question or avoid the question, but one nice thing is in the next year or two, we, we will have other options. Uh, there, there's a, a left atrial appendage uh, closure device that, that's actually currently available that requires an endocardial, a combined endocardial epicardial approach. It's called uh, the, the Lariat. Uh, device and you basically snare the left atrial appendage and close it off. Hasn't really been studied regular, rigorously in, in um, randomized trials. There's another device that um, is probably going to get FDA approval sooner rather than later, the Watchman device, uh, which um, is basically a, um, uh, a device that, that is delivered endocardially into the left atrial appendage and uh, it's, it's just a, um, you know, it's just this kind of mesh that you deploy in there that endothelializes over time uh, and uh, just takes out that space. And in, uh, it's actually been shown to have a uh, possible mortality benefit uh, in its use compared to warfarin, you know, compared to, you know, what for a long time has, has been the gold standard. And, you know, certainly I think there'll be more options down the road in, in those elderly patients who you know, we're, we're reluctant to anticoagulate because, you know, I, I think most doctors, you know, it's, it's always about first doing no harm. So. Yes. Uh, there are a number of uh, products that are out of the anticoagulants used for traumatic wounds, uh, which are literally four to wounds, and they result in instant blind. Now, Will NOAC uh, prevent that from working, or is it not known? Or? Gosh, I, I don't, I don't have any, um, I don't have any knowledge of that. That's what I'm going to have to look up. I didn't even know that yeah, agents like that were available. And, uh, I mean, Do you know the, the mechanism of uh, the, the mechanism by which they work, or or what the active ingredient is? I've got some. I've got. I've not sat down and. and, yeah. and, and no, that, that's very interesting. Yeah. Like I said, even for large battlefield ones, it just instantly stops bleeding. That's, yeah, that, that's something I'm going to have to look into. I can even imagine that being slurring and put down the GI tract if you need it. Yeah. If it works, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll have to look into that. That's fascinating. Yeah. And uh, what do you think about the half life between Geraldo and Pixaban being the same, one is a once a day medication, the other one is BID. How comfortable are you using Xarelto? Yeah, so uh, it, it, the, the question is, um, you know, Xarelto uh, uh, versus uh, Eliquis, they're both factor 10A inhibitors. And if you look at their, the pharmacokinetics of these meds, they, they, they're, they're very similar. Uh, uh, and really, the, the half-life of Xarelto is, um, is only, you know, somewhere a little over 12 hours, even though it's a, a once-a-day uh, medication. Uh, and, uh, you know, for one thing, j just on the, the Xarelto front, it's very important if, um, if you have a patient on Xarelto, make sure they're taking it with the biggest meal of the day, which, you know, in the U.S. is almost always dinner. Uh, what, what I've been told is that... Uh, if they're not taking it with the largest meal of the day, you're basically giving them a BID medication uh, uh, once a day, and, and they're, they're not going to be covered appropriately. 
my, my feelings on, on the Zerelto versus Eliquis, why once a day, why twice a day, I think at the end of the day, these were probably marketing decisions on the, um, on the part of the, of the drug manufacturers. And I think that, um, that whoever the manufacturer is of, uh, of, Pradac, uh, of um, Zerelto probably said, well, look, our, our niche is going to be uh, uh, once a day dosing. Yes, we're going to have a higher peak uh, because we need to give more than you know, the, the dose perhaps that, that would be ideally safe as a BID. So there may be a little more bleeds. Uh, and then you know, we're, we're going to get to a lower trough. So perhaps there might be uh, a few more strokes too. The, um, the, and if you look, you know, there's no way to compare two trials side by side. But if you look at the Rocket AF trial, uh, it was, it was a, um, uh, an on-treatment trial. If you, and as an on-treatment uh, analysis, and I don't want to go into the statistics of it, uh, it was uh, superior to warfarin with regard to stroke reduction. Most major randomized clinical trials are intention to treat. You're, you're left in the group that you started with. Uh, and as an intention to treat, uh, it was non-inferior uh, to warfarin, which is, which is pretty good. It's great to have something that's non-inferior to warfarin. Uh, with regard to stroke reduction, but if you compare that to the, the um, Aristotle trial, which is the, the Eliquis uh, Pixaban trial, where that same factor 10a is given as a BID, now you have uh, a significant reduction in strokes compared to uh, warfarin, and also a significant reduction in bleeds. So I, I think at the end of the day, uh, Zarelto may have sacrificed a little bit of its efficacy and safety in order for it to be administered as a once-a-day drug. That being said, you know, compliance with drugs is, uh, is pretty poor. And I, and I showed earlier, you know, at, at most, you know, maybe patients are complying, you know, 80% uh, of the time with their, um, with their medications. And, and obviously, with a BID drug, compliance uh, goes down uh, versus a, a QD drug. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure how to answer your question, but um, other than to say it was, it was probably a, um, you know, it was probably something that was, was thought about by, by, you know, people in the, in the top tiers of the company and it was a decision based on um, the advantages they'd get from, from compliance and marketing. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you very much.